lot of dangerous people. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us today. I know Labor Day weekend, you could have been doing about a hundred other things, so I think it says a lot about you guys, it says a lot about our movement that we're able to fill this room. Um, you know, that this is a, that there's more people here in this room right now than there was at the federal convention where I was elected party leader originally. And so that tells you how far we've come. And I'm going to BC uh, in one month's time, and there'll be just as many people, if not more, in Vancouver. This happens everywhere I go across Canada. I'm seeing more and more libertarians show up. More and more people have caught on to the idea of liberty, and they're wanting to do something about it because they see the direction our society is going. I want to tell you a little story about what it's like to be a liberty activist. Um, I think this story perfectly illustrates the challenge we face. About, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I, I was uh, a fire lieutenant, and I was called to a, a structure fire. It was a four-story building, and I was charged with going in, finding the, the, the seat of the fire, and doing primary search and rescue and fire suppression. So I took my team up to the fourth floor. We found the fire room because we could see the smoke billowing out from underneath it. We forced the door open and we started doing our search. And to my surprise, uh, through the smoke, as I entered the living room, I could see this figure laying down on the couch. The figure was a very obese woman, probably about 350 pounds. She was buck naked and she was completely motionless. Didn't look like she was breathing. I assumed she was dead based on the amount of smoke that was in the apartment. I thought we'd be doing a body removal. But I went up to her and as I approached her, I could see all the signs of immediate gratification that, uh, that she was addicted to. She had empty vodka bottles. She had empty cigarette uh, cartons. She had a ton of empty Cheeto bags. And she had re remains of like Cheetos wedged into all her fat rolls as she lay, <laughs> lay there. And, and um, <laughs> I leaned over her and and pinched her trapezius to see if she was awake. And to my surprise, her eyes sprung open, kind of a look of shock on her eyes. And then she noticed that, that there was a firefighter basically nose to nose with her. I, was, I had a mask on and um, I, I yelled at her. I said, look, we gotta go. Your apartment's on fire. Let's go, let's get out of here. And she looked at me and she said, come here, honey. And she grabbed me around the back of my neck and pulled me in and she tried to, tried to smooch me through my mask. I pushed her away, said, no, look, we got to go. Your apartment's on fire. Let's go now. And she just grabbed me. She said, come here, sweetie. And uh, <laughs> she wanted a makeout session with a firefighter. And again, she wanted immediate gratification, despite the fact that her world was burning down around her and her life was in danger. Um, so I, I said, look, we got to go now. Uh, I'm not doing this with you. And at that point, her face screwed up into this very hateful scowl and she raised her middle finger to me and said fuck you and i'm like all right well i'm gonna have to violate the non-aggression principle here i grabbed her by her hands and i drug her through the, that apartment kicking and screaming and swearing out into the hallway to safety called ems and made sure they had a blanket on her and that she was safe and then as i was going back in i turned around to look at her again and she looked at me and swore at me again and that, ladies and gentlemen, is what it's like being the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada. <laughs> we have a society that is, is fallen from grace. It's uh, addicted to immense, immediate gratification. It's, it, it, you know, and, and I think about this quite often. What was the cause of that fire. It was not her, I mean the immediate cause, the proximate cause, I guess you could say is that she put a cigarette butt and left it burning in her mattress and it caught fire. But there were a million little steps that led up to that catastrophic event. And probably starting back sometime in childhood, I imagine she probably didn't have a very pleasant childhood, but she made bad decisions all the way along her life. Right? She, was, she was on welfare, she um, obviously you know, didn't do the work necessary to make herself economically viable, she was addicted to all sorts of substances. Her life was liter had literally become hell, and it didn't become hell from her dropping that cigarette into her mattress, it had become hell long before that. It was a death by a million cuts, and eventually everything around her collapsed. 
And this is what we're facing now. And we, there, there has to be an intervention. And it's not pleasant being the person that has to make the intervention. But that's what we are charged with here today, I would argue. And so this, this is the challenge of being a liberty activist. Um, I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson. And he talks, uh, there, there was a, a quote, and I'm trying to remember it, but it's something like this. Nothing creates a better world than stating your truth. Okay, what, when you tell the truth, that sends ripples out into the world that create order. And so we can't be afraid to stand on the truth. And that's what the Libertarian Party of Canada is there to do. We're here to tell unpopular truths to people. It's not necessarily going to win us any votes to tell people that uh, taxation is theft or that, uh, you know, healthcare maybe shouldn't be run by the government or that maybe public schools were designed to control people or all these uncomfortable things we have to say. But someone has to say them. Someone has to speak truth to the world if we're going to see this chaos uh, brought to order. And so that, that's the challenge that we face right now. And I'll tell you, um, you know, four years ago, I, I had no intention of be getting involved in politics. I didn't want to do anything. I, what actually happened was I almost died in a house fire. I, I thought for sure my life was over. And that was a ch changing point, turning point in my life. I realized that I had to stop playing small. I had to start living my principles. And I had to stop living a life of comfort. You know, I had my life mapped out. I was at the top of my career as a battalion chief. I, I was making a very good income. I had the two cars. I had the nice house. I had, you know, everything was going my way, conventionally speaking. But I knew that I wasn't being everything I could be. I didn't, I, I realized I wasn't espousing or wasn't embodying the principles that I spoke into the world. And so um, after that fire, I, I decided I wasn't, I was going to leave everything on the mat when it came to life and opportunities start presenting themselves to me. And this was one of the opportunities to stand up for the Libertarian Party of Canada. And I just started speaking my truth. Um, you, you probably saw the meme that put me on the map, which was I want gay married couples to be able to protect their marijuana plants with guns. Well, I, that was like two or three days into my campaign, uh, just in a by-election, and it, it went out into the world, got picked up by Fox News and CNN. This hour is 22 minutes made fun of me. And next thing you know, I'm in the international spotlight, and two months later, I'm standing as the nominee for the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada. So it started with speaking a very simple truth. It caught on, and it wasn't easy to say these truths. I mean, look, when, when you're, uh, I would rather run into a burning building than stand on a stage in front of a, an unfriendly audience with my knees shaking, knocking, and my voice shaking, and tell these, talk about these things but this is the thing that has to be done. Uh, and it, you know, as, as serious as house fires are, the fire that, the chaos that is consuming Western civilization right now is far more dangerous. And so we need to organize and we need to start putting some water on this uh, fast. All along the way, so let, let's look at where we have come from, from the party basically being held aloft by a dedicated libertarian basically in his basement keeping all the paperwork filed and doing all the things necessary to where we're at today with infrastructure across the country with Maxime Bernier almost winning leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada um, and now knocking on our door which I'll talk about in a bit um, this is all because I'm surrounded with people that like me are willing to make sacrifices right now uh, sacrifice their comfort, sacrifice their time and energy because we have an important mission. And all these good things have come because of that. And so that's the importance of this party and that's why I believe in it so strongly. This is why I have resisted temptation to join mainstream parties even though offers come my way fairly regularly to join up and be pragmatic and get votes and get into parliament and those kinds of things. Because I, I see the difference we're making, and I don't think any mainstream party can make that same claim. How, how many mainstream parties have actually repealed government in any direction? Under three terms of a Conservative Party of Canada government, um, which the leader, Stephen Harper, was touted initially as libertarian-leaning, uh, government grew to its 
greatest size and most costly size in Canadian history. Now, of course, it's growing at an even faster rate with Justin Trudeau, but we can expect the Conservative government under Andrew Scheer to continue its government growth. Mind you, it may be a slightly slower rate, but this fire is still spreading. No one's putting water on it except us. We're making a difference. And so now we're faced with an opportunity. I've been talking with Maxime Bernier over the last week. You probably saw that I have made overtures to him about joining our party, about taking my spot as leader and taking this party to the next level. Uh, I've been making those overtures for over a year now. Maxime is now on the outs with the Conservative Party of Canada. He's starting his own party and he's talking with me about a possible merger with our party. And so this is what's going to be facing you guys, our members, uh, over the next month or two. Do we want to unify the Liberty vote under a Maxime Bernier-led party? Which I'd be happy to do, by the way. I have, you know, my, my primary goal is liberty for my kids. It's not uh, some seat in power or some, you know, th th there's, there's no benefit to me to be leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada other than I might be able to create a better world for my kids eventually. That's the only thing in it for me, is, is to maybe, I'm just geared to fight fires and that's what I want to do. That's the highest meaning I could have in life. And so that's what it means to me. But if someone else can do that job better, I'm happy to step aside and let them do it. So if, if the membership wants to merge and if they want Maxime Bernier to leave, I'm happy to support Max, happy to support that party direction. Alternately, if you, want to keep our party uh, the way it's been, continually grinding it out on the fringes, I'm happy to do that too. I'm happy to fight fires from any, any direction. So that, that is the conversation we need to start having now because um, we are having conversations with Max and the, the question is gonna be posed to you, the membership, probably within the next month or two, do you see value in merging? Do you see value in uniting the Liberty vote and going that direction. So um, I'm, I'm gonna open up for questions right now before I turn the mic over to Derek Fildebrand. Does anyone have any questions? Why doesn't yeah. Max just use your infrastructure, right? Well, that, that's what we're talking with Max about, right? And so he, he wants, he, his, um, I think what they're thinking 